Dio Ho, Hara Mai, and welcome to Waipa District Libraries here in Cambridge. It's great to be involved in the New Zealand Book Awards for Children and Young Adults, which celebrates the achievements of local authors and illustrators. And we're thrilled to have been chosen to host an event for Books Alive featuring this book by Michael Petherick. Hashtag Tumiki, which is a finalist in the Wright Family Foundation Esther Glenn Award for Junior Fiction. Tumiki is a multimedia mashup which we're going to bring to life with the help of some of our librarians and local celebrities and even a cameo by author Michael. And afterwards we'll speak to Michael about his work and his inspiration for Tumiki. So without further ado, welcome to the world of Hashtag. Diary, brand new school, day three. New kids now coming out of my paws in a fug. Ugh. The kids seem nice, but no one really actually wants to hang out with me yet. That's what Dad says. The power of yet. No one wants to hang out with me yet. The school is ultra beige, literally. Won't hold it against the kids because they didn't choose the colour. But ugh, times two. Plus, how about all the concrete? What school doesn't have grass and trees? Dad at work until five, so I went to the library. Started this diary. His idea for a way to channel my new kid, Fug. Headphones on so I could pretend I was listening to something insanely interesting instead of being dreadflock no mates. There's a notice board in the library for you. I love a good notice board, especially the one in the supermarket back home. This one's a classic. A notice from a guy who's lost his goat. Nine-eyed dirt man. Who wants to sell a pile of dirt? A galaxy hidden in the palm of your hand? Who are these people? What can you do with a pile of dirt? A librarian was patrolling the notices. Pointy eagle glasses, raked up at the corners and a cardi straight off the rack at the Cats Protection League. A collection of badges. Save the dinosaurs from themselves. A Philip Larkin a day keeps the sunshine away. Philip Larkin? She was pulling out pins, screwing up notices, enjoying a tidy up. I wanted to say, mean, don't do that. Instead, I distracted her, smiled sweetly. Excuse me, can you please recommend some books? I like sci-fi and fantasy. We went straight to the O's. The Silver Crown by Robert C. O'Brien, review pending. But so far, seriously creepy. Also, Ghost by Jason Reynolds. Not sci-fi or fantasy, about running. Mm. When she described it, I thought, do I look like I read books about running and stuff? We'll see. Yeah. The diversion tactic worked anyway, and Eagle Glasses knows the Newtown Library like it's an extension of her brain. Plus, I saved a few notices, even found space for two of my own. Came up with some eye-catching material, pinned my notices up, sent a prayer to the universe. Please let someone a little bit cool notice my notice. Not Gary, who has lost his goat. So maybe I should let him know his one's been binned. I guess I'd better text Gary. Is this Gary? The librarian took down your notice. If you make another one, I'll keep an eye on it. To Mickey! Constable Lutene, I saw your notice at the library. Would love to meet to discuss sometime. I 
community event. Sounds intriguing. This term, the senior syndicate's focus is leadership. It could be a great way to encourage our students to walk the talk. To Mecca, I have parent teacher interviews this week, but perhaps a meeting after that. Tanakwe Anahere, working with your kids sounds a lot better than school visits with the dog handler, trips in the patrol car, sirens blasting, always fun, but keen to give something else a go. Have been wondering about Waitangi Festival in Newtown, perhaps at the school? Now I'm thinking we call it too Mecca. Might be too major of a major? Let me know if it's yeah slash nah. Nga mihi, Constable Ruth Tene. Piri piri. Kia ora You've struck gold in the staff room. Tumiki idea, excellent. A community focused engagement will tick endless boxes with the principal and the school committee. Plus, two and a bit terms for dreaming up ideas. Our kids will love it. I had non contact on Tuesday, so I could do 11am at that new place on Gundry Street. Forget the name, but great cheese scones. 11am Tuesday sounds perfect. If you mean Cafe 71, I'm in. They're lolly cake. Breakfast of champions. Two Mickey. Hello Pete, here's my first drawing, giving Mr. T a triple reverse jackknife, followed by a flying forehead in the pop tart. Have been practicing the chicken wing soup legs. Hurt my arm, Monty. Hmm. I'm looking for the owner of Nanny. Hmm? This is Constable Rutene of Newtown Police. Did you know it is a breach of council bylaws to keep goats in Newtown? What? Right. I'm bound by law to inform you that emojis can be and may be used against you in a court of law. I'm also bound to inform you we've received multiple complaints of a goat leaving its calling card in Gundry Street. Huh? If Nanny isn't collected, I'll be forced to take action. Hmm. Now this is an amazing piece of art by Rishi. When I'm older, I will be the best rhyme ninja you will see. I'll spin my rhymes like Krishna did and blow the whole electric grid. And they'll say, remember him? He even rhymed with synonym. Well, not that I can say the word, but you know what I mean. He had the flow at the age of 10. He kicked it with that ballpoint pen. So clap your hands and stamp your feet. It's time to hit that ninja beat. It's time to hit that ninja beat. It's time to hit that ninja beat. One, two, three, four times. It's time to hit that ninja beat by Rishi. Nice work. To Mickey. Another day, another Dear Diary entry. Library again today. Eagle Glasses was talking to a guy in a lime green hoodie. I couldn't clock his face, but he had a notice. E.g. pinned it up. Galaxy Man. I ran outside to get a look, but he disappeared down Green Street. The identity of Galaxy Man will remain a mystery, for now. Back at the library, Eagle Glasses crazy waved me from history. She had a pile of books for me. Morris G, Salt. A graphic one called Palestine. She tried to give me some Laura Ingalls Wilder, but been there, done that years ago. Got home and didn't know which book to read first. Book fever, Dad reckoned. Palestine won out. Dreadflock certified assessment. Sad, but glad I read it. A notice dropped out when I opened it. On the back, Eagle Glasses had written, Galaxy Man notices make good bookmarks, don't you think? You could collect the whole set. Positive development on the new kid front. 
Jonah and I hang out together at lunchtime. It seems having a friend camps it was out the new kid smell. Dad and I discovered the Newtown Vegetable Market on Saturday morning. So many people. Overwhelming. There was a guy busking with a harmonica in a quiet spot between the stalls. Jonah calls him harmonica man. Says it's not the last time I'll hear him playing Lord's 400 Lux in E minor either. To Mickey! Good morning, Mr. Vibrant. My name is Monty, and I saw your notice at the library. Also, are you the guy who draws mowers? I found your handout. So, can I please do art lessons? Here are some aliens. From Monty. Send. Oh, Jeanette, uh, someone's, someone's answered one of those handouts. Good day. Oh, I hate these computer keyboards. I prefer to just write it down with a pen. Afternoon, Monty. Great aliens. Could you talk to your parents? That's a that's a really good alien. And this is going to be good, Jeanette. And suggest a time. By the way, my name isn't really Mr. Vibrant. Thanks for that, Jeanette. My wife told me that I had to use it for business purposes, so please don't call me that. It's Steve. Sorry, Mr. Vibrant. I could have done Thursday, but that is when we walked the dog. Tuesday is football. Mum says Friday I get tired. Weekends are also football, dog, and sometimes the Sunday market. Do any of these times suit? From Monty. Send. Oh, that, that boy's emailed me back, Jeanette. He's, he's pretty keen on these lessons. Hello again, Monty. You, you haven't really suggested a time. If you like, I can phone one of your parents to arrange something. Please don't call me Mr. Steve Vibrant either. It's plain, capital letters, thank you, Jeanette, S-T-E-V-E, -E -E. Steve. Mr. Steve, not Steve Vibrant. I arrange all my own stuff so mum and dad won't help, sorry. Like I said, Thursday is good, except dog walking. Tuesday and Friday are not good. Wednesday might be. Dad says definitely not weekends if we need to go camping. Monty, send. So, does 4 p.m. on Wednesday work? Mr. Steve, no, Dad says. Wednesday is not good now. From Monty, send. You, you see, the problem with doing these art lessons that you suggested, Jeanette, is that children are virtually impossible to organise. <clears throat> Monty, I'm not sure this is going to work out. And you can't spell my name correctly. We can't seem to arrange a time and open parentheses, pardon me for saying this, close parentheses, but I wonder if you're really interested. Maybe get in touch when you have a gap in your busy schedule question mark S underlined s t e v e mr steve 
Wednesday at 4 p.m. is very good, thanks. Pardon me, you are beginning to sound quite growly for an artist. Here's a picture of me having a kick around with my friend, Mr. Pete Eistagger. Monty, send. Oh, geez, uh, Jeanette, he sent me a picture of uh, Pete Munro. Classic. A good picture, Monty. I know, Mr. Ice Digger, <laughs> AKA Pete Munro. He's lived on Green Street as long as I can remember. Sorry if I came across annoyed. It's the mind of the artist, you see. A deep and complicated thing, Monty, but I can teach you about that sometime. See you on Wednesday, Steve. Send. To Mickey! Good afternoon. Welcome to Dreadflox Graphic Novel Club. Here are my top 10 graphic novels. Number one, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind by Hayao Miyazaki. The book, the movie, the manga, the only. If you like my neighbor Totoro, then this is your happy place. Nimona by Noel Stevenson. Down with the institution of law enforcement and heroics. This One Summer by Mariko and Gillian Tamaki. Persepolis by Ma Jane Satrapi. Made me think, should I do a graphic novel about my life? Anya's Ghost by Vera Broskol. I read somewhere that this author was inspired by a band to write this book. Music, inspiration. Al Defo by Cece Bell. The Arrival by Sean Tan. Ghosts by Raina Tell Jemaya and Smile and Sisters for old time's sake. Shaolin Burning by Ant Sang. Thanks for the recommendation, Jonas Elector. And The Storm in the Barn by Matt Phelan. Another great book from Eagle Glasses. Who knows the library likes it. It's an extension of her brain. Any questions? To Mickey! Official Newtownite nailed the fist bump. Oh, here on Newtownite, me and my friends are helping organise the Waitangi Festival of Newtown School. It's called Too Meke, meaning awesome or too much. Or even be surprised. Take your pick. All those options describe Newtown, by the way. I just moved here. It's epic. Two Mickey will have everything you can dream of. And some you can't. Kiss the goat, for example. <laughs> Two dollars a vote. You choose. Who does the kissing? It'll have the best lolly cake since 1971. A man who sells dirt. Just go with it. And palette paneer and banana cake made by Rishi's mum. Who should be a celebrity chef. It'll have loads of music. The Newtown International Witty Crew are helping us with Kapahaka, which will be awesome. Think Pūrea Nei, 
on synthesizer, a tape orchestra, that's me and my mates throwing down our musical shapes. And did I mention Decibel Riot Squad? That's right, Newtown, the greatest girl band south of Samoa is coming to a festival near you. Come help us celebrate Waitangi Day in Newtown. Aotearoa New Zealand, that's us. That's what hashtag two Mickey is all about. We'll all be there, including the guy who plays Lord Covers on his harmonica down at the supermarket. The mysterious Galaxy Man might even be there. If you see someone in a lime green hoodie, let me know. It's hashtag two Mickey on Insta and everywhere else online. Spread the word, come along on 6 February. We're saving some lolly cake for you. This is now D-Flock signing off. Want more? d recommendation. Buy the book or take it out from your local library. To Mickey. Well, I hope you all enjoyed our production of Hashtag To Mickey. To Mickey is taught through text, Instagram, emails, flyers, committee minutes, posters, daily entry, diary entries, blog posts, chat rooms, school homework, raps, and of course, the hilarious community notice board. Some of this we managed to capture, or we hope we managed to capture in our production. The rest we hope you will enjoy as you work your way through this iconic piece of work. It's now my great pleasure to welcome and introduce you to author Michael Petherick, Mike, who of course was the voice and sometimes in shot as well of art teacher Steve Vibrant in our production. Mike hasn't seen the final product, by the way, so it will still be a surprise to him. Kia ora, Mike. Hara mai. Kia ora, Dee. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for us to have you join us. Cheers. Mike, can I first ask, uh, what was your inspiration for Tumiki and how did the idea of the multimedia mashup come about? Well... It, it kind of came about over uh, a few years of work. So I, um, I had a couple of, of stories that were published in a publication called The Annual, The Annual and The Annual 2. And in that, we started working on having a multimedia, um, a kind of multimedia piece with lots of different characters. And one of the things that we uh, really wanted to explore, both my publisher and myself, was the idea of children writing to each other and talking to each other in the way that kids write and talk to each other now. So that's, you know, if you, if you watch your kids, they're always texting and they're always on Instagram and they're just making up words and then throwing them away using lots of, um, you know, emojis, car emojis, those Japanese emojis, um, you know, sending pictures to each other. So we wanted to just reflect what kids do these days. It was awesome. Did, yeah. And how did the ideas evolve? how they evolve. Well, um, I suppose we wanted to have a, uh, a really strong main character to the book. So one of the first things I did was start to work on the diary entries that run right through. So there's a, there's a diary entry that runs right through the, uh, right through the book by a character called Dreadflock. So we took inspiration from kids that we, uh, were around us, you know, I, I, uh, Quite a few of the kids are based on kids um, who uh, my children are going to school with, um, and Dreadflock in particular. So she's a really strong main character. Now she's actually based on someone who I used to be um, kind of kick around in bands with when I was young, and I imagined her. Uh, I just imagined her not just being herself, but exactly the same as when I knew her, which was when she was in her twenties, but being twelve or thirteen, someone who was just really cool you know, that uh, with lots of different kind of hairstyles and hair colours and really into music, just a really inspirational kid. I think when you see our production, Mike, you'll be really pleased at the librarian I've chosen to play Dreadflock because she's got purple hair. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> now, when I first read um, to Mickey, I wasn't sure whether Dreadflock was a girl or a boy. And I actually wondered in the context of the... Um, of the book, whether that actually mattered. Yeah, lots of people have said that. That's really that's really cool. I, yeah, I mean, Dreadflock's definitely a girl, but she's, um, uh, you know, when we were growing up, I suppose we called um, androgynous people tom uh, tomboys if they were girls. So, um, 
you know, I imagine Dreadflock is someone who was just um, getting in and doing all kinds of stuff. She's definitely a girl, but yeah, I, re I really like the fact that some people might think she's a boy and some people might think she's a girl. That's cool. Fantastic. Um, Monty is another one of my favourite characters. Can you tell us a little bit more about Monty and his character? Um, and again, I presume that Monty was a boy, but again, I, I wondered whether it mattered. And do you think Monty's drawings will ever improve? <laughs> yeah, Monty's definitely a boy. He um, He's actually based on a real life Monty that I know. So this kid, um, he get, just gets around in uh, combat trousers and he's always, you know, he's got stuff in his pockets all the time and he's always climbing hills and he's got knives and, um, you know, guns and all that kind of stuff. His parents are like full hippies and they, they look at him and think, where did this kid come from? He's just insane. He just doesn't seem like either of them. So my Monty is based on a real life Monty who is just like really, really out there and just like full of energy and always up for things. And yeah, of course, Monty's drawing is going to get better. He's going to get really good. He's going to be like one of New Zealand's great artists. He's got Steve Vibrant as a teacher after all. And who is your favorite character? Oh, easily Dreadflock. Yeah, there's no question about it. I wanted uh, Dreadflock to be someone who I imagine myself being friends with when I was a kid, but I never had a Dreadflock in my life. So I, um, I just imagined someone like that. Her name was actually really, really important to me. So, um, you know, we always know people in our lives who we know by a nickname and we don't even, we might not even know their real name or we might not use their real name. So when I went to university, there was a drummer who was in bands. His name was Prong. And I, I never knew his real name. No one ever, no one ever called him by his real name. He was just Prong. So with Dreadflock, it was, part of it was, hey, you know, let's have this character who, um, yeah, she's known by all of these different names, but does anyone know her real name? I think she's even called Dee in the book a couple of times, so that's quite strange. Oh, that's well, there we go. Yeah, yeah, like your name, Dee. I mean, that's right. Is, is Dee your real name, or is it just a nickname? It's just it's, again, it's know. just a nickname. <laughs> so, how did you organise your ideas for the book? Um, obviously, there's a thread going through it, which is about the organisation of the Waitangi Festival festival but in terms of all the emails and the um, text messages and the Instagram posts and the and the pictures did you just go where the mood took you or did things have a certain place that's really that's really cool that you asked that question Dee because with um with the book we wanted to have a really live feel so it was just like kids were texting each other and the whole thing was evolving really naturally and obviously we've got kids who are doing drawings and stuff in the book so it has this kind of wild and crazy feel like it's just evolving in front of you but the uh, the kind of backstory of doing a book is that you're um, you're highly organized and so we um, the book was actually written in three parts so we had uh, an introductory part so we really consciously uh, decided to work it up in three parts so we had this first part where the characters were introduced and we kind of get to know them. And then we have this big second part where um, the characters evolve and things happen to them and we kind of get inside them and we emotionally connect with them. And then the last part is, is that classic bit where the Waitangi, uh, the Waitangi Day is being organised. And so we, there we kind of build up to this crescendo of the Waitangi Day happening and all the characters kind of jumping in on it. So, yeah, we were... Um, it was a, it was a great it was a great thing to do. We also um, uh, the book is kind of a team project, so you know, like I'm I'm the author, but the uh, there's a graphic designer Marcus who uh, he's he did all the graphic design and a lot of the a lot of the drawings are there. So I used to be in bands with Marcus, and he sits just down uh, the corridor for me in the studio. And um, so he'd come along, you know, he was working on the book and he'd come along and say, so what's going on with that, Monty? Like, wh why is he doing that? Or, you know, what about Constable Perpi? What's he up to? And uh, so we'd just have conversations about that stuff and, and build it up that way. So that was a cool organising principle. And then there's also Paul Beavis, the guy who does all the art in there. So with the artwork um i kind of wanted the artwork to reflect the process that monty and steve were going through 
So I had a couple of uh, sessions with Paul where I'd just say, you know, what, am I, what are artists into and what kind of stuff do they do? And if you were really teaching Monty, what kind of stuff would you be telling him? And so we built that up as part of the, um, the interaction between those two. So there were lots of different ways of working in there. And then obviously I had these uh, really great editors, so Susan Paris and Kate de Goldie were my editors, but they're also the they're also the main publisher for the book. So I have a, uh, the annual Inc is the main publisher, and so always working with them and showing them drafts and then refining them. It was it was a really great project to be working on. We all had a lot of fun. Fantastic. Now, um, as I think I mentioned to you um, previously, when I was looking at the Massey University website, who's published this book, um, I learned a new word. Called, which was epistolary fiction, and I think it's the style in which Tumaki is written. But what exactly is it? And did you intend writing in that style? Epistolary fiction, yeah, 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 definitely. That's that's definitely a thing, and it's definitely a Tumaki thing. So, epistolary fiction is a book that's written using correspondence, and there's lots of examples of them through history. So, uh, Frankenstein is an example or uh, Dracula is another example, or there's another one called the uh, uh, Guernsey Potato Peel and Pie Society, uh, where that's written in diary entries. So that's that was really consciously the style that we wanted uh, to make it to be in. And uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it, was, it was really great to explore that, particularly with the texts. So the texts, you know, that's that's the point at which you don't, you, you almost don't even know who's talking to each other. You've just got a speech bubble, then another speech bubble, then another speech bubble. And uh, uh, for that, I, I kind of based that on some really cool authors, probably one sitting around the bookshelf behind me, Roddy Doyle. So he's an Irish author and he just writes basically in speech. So the epistolary fiction side of it was, yeah, that was, we really consciously went for that. Um, it is an epistolary book. Fantastic. Now, you mentioned music, and you are also a musician. Can you tell us a little bit about that and any influence that that had on the book, which obviously you've previously mentioned that it did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The music was a really big thing. Um, so, like I said, with the artwork, um, um, I wanted to reflect the artistic side, you know, the artistic creativity side of the characters. And I did that by talking to an artist. And so with the music, I'd already, I've already I'm, I'm kind of halfway through another book about musicians. And so I've been thinking about the musical process and what it involves. I, I wanted to use um, instruments that I actually had around me in real life. So Dreadflox bass, this is Dreadflox bass right here. Fantastic. Awesome bass. Hold on a second. Bass. So this bass here got hooked around my chair. This is my daughter's bass. So she's uh, she's thirteen. Oh no, she's fifteen. No, she's going to kill me for saying that. Uh, she's fifteen, and uh, and she's hearing the bass. Whoop. She oh, heard you. Yeah, she heard me. She's in the background. I'm just showing. I'm just showing these guys your bass. It's a really cool. Thirteen-year-old daughter's bass. I thought you were going to play something for us for a little minute. Oh, no, I've got too many instruments to show you. So um, so that's Red Fox bass. And this here is a drum machine. This is my little calculator drum machine. Um, so uh, Joan is really into his drum machines and, in fact, his whole family. So that there is the little calculator drum machine. Got this awesome drum machine here. So that's uh, another one. I think there's even a photo of this one in the book somewhere. We took lots of photos of different instruments. Uh, so this, this is my first drum machine, this one here. It's a really good drum machine. And oh, this here, there's definitely a photo of this in the book. So this here is a tape machine. Now this stuff, oh, there it is. Look, you can see it says, uh, too Mickey to live, too, stuck, too skucks to die. So these things, are, <laughs> these things are like space junk these days. Nobody wants to use them at all. And uh, you can find them in second-hand shops if you're really lucky. So I bought this one in about, I don't know, what, 1989, 1990. And we used to use it to record bands. So, um, so yeah, the, the whole uh, tape machine thing, I just had this 
uh, I just was really interested in this idea that kids might actually be um, uh, rediscovering tape decks and getting into it again. And, you know, it's this whole retro thing, but they're making music with them again. So the kids are going to the dump and finding old tapes and chopping them up and putting them back together again. So it was, yeah, it was just a really, it was just a fun thing to be exploring. Cool. I, I would suggest that some of the people who are watching this broadcast now will be thinking, what's a tape machine? So anyone out there thinking, what is a tape machine? Just ask your parents. This here's a tape machine. Look, there's a tape in there. Oh, I'm going to get it up the right way. See, this is a tape machine and you uh, look, it's got a record button and a play button. Inside there, look, there's a little tape. It's just crazy. Who would have guessed? You know, this is the way that we used to listen to music. So when I was a little kid, uh, like we're talking like a four or five year old, my parents went away to Hawaii and they came back with a tape deck. It was like a Philips one. I found a photo of it on the internet and uh, it's got this big long name. And so we used to sit around, we'd have like, we'd have the tape deck and we'd press record and then we'd kind of like hear our voices and then we'd, we'd record the radio. So we'd have these little mashups and then one day, mum and dad came home with a second tape deck. So we'd have them sitting right next to each other. So we'd play one and record the other one. It was just awesome. Mike, have you seen the program? I think it's called Back to the 80s. <laughs> it's uh, apparently one of the recent episodes they were asked to, one of their challenges was to uh, tape a tape. <laughs> yeah, I've seen ads for Back in the 80s. That just looks amazing. That looks like a like looks like some kind of the insides of Taika Waititi's brain kind of splurged splurged down onto the television screen. Oh, look, it's just fantastic. Now, getting back to the book, how did you go about marketing to Mickey to Massey University Press, and did you talk to any other publishers? Well, yeah. So this is the thing. So um, I, people might not realise it. <laughs> I don't think I've got a copy of the book right here, but so there's actually two publishers with this book. It's called, uh, I think it's called book packaging. So what Massey university do is they get other publishers to produce books and then they, they, uh, they publish them and, and market them and distribute them. So my publishers, the, uh, the publishers who have been working with me for quite a long time, it's annual Inc. So they are the people who publish a series of books called the annual and uh, they've just published another book by Damien Wilkins called Aspiring. Um, and um, so, that, so I worked with Kate DeGoldi and Susan Paris, who are the publishers of Annual Link, and they produce the book. And then they, they, they basically package a book and deliver it to Massey University Press. So the, the main publisher of Massey University Press, Nicola Leggett, has an arrangement with these, with these guys to produce a certain number of books each year. Uh, so I, I'm really lucky. I didn't have to. I didn't have to do anything as far as the Massey University Press relationship went. Um, I um, I was fortunate to have two people who believed in me and who wanted to help me to um, produce a book. Fantastic. So um, how's the book been received? Have they given you any feedback yet? Oh, most people think it's really terrible, and uh, I mean, basically, no one's really, really in no one's interested in it. It's, it's what it is. No, I'm just being silly. It's a really awesome book and you've got to go out and buy it. It's just amazing. Everybody loves it. Everyone really, really loves it. They do love it. And, and just, just on that, I mean, in my view, I think this is a book for everyone. But yeah, this is the book for everyone. This is a book for <laughs> absolutely everyone. Like adults and children can also, both adults and children and people in the middle can read it too. Bedtime reading? It is bedtime reading, and it's also it's also for breakfast. <laughs> but seriously, though we are being serious, I know. Who did you originally um, want to appeal to? Uh, so, um, so annual link are big on appealing to uh, middle readers. So, kind of like you know, a precocious eight year old through to like a twelve or a thirteen year old. So we're. Uh, mo almost all of their books are consciously pitched at middle readers. So it's going for that age group. Um, but an, another thing that we did with this book, because it's not just words, it's also a lot of pictures, we had a look at a lot of graphic novels. Um, so another person that I share my studio with is a guy called Dylan Horrocks. And uh, so he's a graphic novelist. He's a really well-known New Zealand graphic novelist. So I had a few conversations with him about laying out books and 
the structure of graphic novels. So it's kind of half novel, half graphic novel. We wanted to appeal to people who didn't just engage with the words, but also with the pictures. Oh. Okay, so obviously you're a, a worthy finalist in the New Zealand Book Awards for children and young adults. You're probably, well, you are up against more traditional forms of writing. How do you think you'll go? Oh, they're going to smash me out of the park, probably. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, well, it would be, uh, it's just, a, it is a real privilege to just be nominated, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some really great authors out there and some really great new talent coming through. So, it's, yeah, it's just a privilege to be nominated and uh, I'll probably get absolutely smashed. Well, just go by the book. <laughs> I think if nothing else, the book really stands out. Um, it stands out in terms of its look on the shelves, its format, its appeal. Look, you could skip a page or two if you wanted to. You can read forwards, start to read it backwards. I don't really think it matters. <laughs> what are you talking about, Dee? You can't read a book forwards and backwards. You can't you just can. like skip pages. It's, that's just a bit weird. I thought you were a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Back to, to Mickey, it's such an iconic piece of work. You probably need a break after it, I know, but where to from here? Oh, I've got a couple of other books on the go. Yeah. Uh, I, um, uh, a, 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 a painter who I um, hang out with a little bit always said to, he said to me, you always need to have three things on the go at any one time. So um, I've got a book that I've been working on for a long time uh, and that's in the bottom drawer at the moment. I've got a music book that um, I'm working on and uh, I'd really like to produce like a kid's album that's based on Two Mickey. So um, kind of half working on that at the moment, getting the drum machines out, drum machine, getting the drum machine out and uh, trying to produce a kid's album. Um, another thing that I've got going uh, just kind of working it up is a book that's kind of a, it's a detective series. It's based in Kawakawa. So um, I don't know if you know Kawakawa very well. It's like a little town in Northland. It has a train running through it. It's got a really famous toilet. Um, so I had this idea of a detective novel with these three kids who get together. You know, there's like a rugby player. Uh, there's like a criminologist. And uh, there's just one who won't leave them alone. And they get together and form the Kawakawa Criminological and Rugby Club. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. That's my next book. Great. And when when do we expect that? Oh, probably in a couple of weeks, I reckon. Yeah, no, I don't reckon. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll take me a little while to get it together. Maybe uh, maybe next year. Now, speaking of places, Newtown. Is there a Newtown in every corner of New Zealand? <laughs> Yeah, so the book is based in Newtown, and uh, Newtown is a really cool concept to be working with. Um, so when you have, you know, when a big city was was built back in the day, the city would get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they'd think, oh, we've got to build another one. So they'd put a new town next to it and just call it Newtown, which, uh, you know, that's that's English language for you. Let's oh, let's just call it Newtown. That's a good idea. So um, so Wellington's got a new town, and Auckland's got a new town. Sydney's got one. Bristol's got one. Uh, if you look, if you Google it in the States, America's got loads and loads of new towns. So new towns are a, they have a particular culture around them. They're really urban. They're old, they're old suburbs that sit next to towns. Um, yeah. So we wanted to, we wanted to get a book together that really reflected a diverse uh, urban culture, particularly in New Zealand right now, you know, like, the kind of diverse urban cultures that we see right throughout New Zealand. So that's, uh, that, that's our new town. It's kind of make believe. And if you look at all the street names, you'll see some of the street names from the Wellington new town. You'll see some of the street names for the Auckland new town and the Sydney new town. And there's one from the Bristol new town. Cause that's where my brother lives. And I thought I'd better stick a Bristol new town street in there. So they'd buy the book. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so uh, speaking of overseas, has the book gone overseas yet? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, lots of copies have sold into Australia, um, That's which is really choice. Um, and that's probably because there's lots of Kiwis living in Australia. I think the book, um, 
it's got a real New Zealand appeal because it's about Waitangi Day at the end of the day, you know. Um, and so that that part of the book's really interesting too. There's a um, there's a festival at a school. It's called the Kotahi Festival, and it's at the Kahurangi School. So um, we've kind of we kind of based the book around our experience of going to Kotahi. Um, yeah. So I mean, yeah. It's it is selling really well, uh, particularly in Australia. Yep. That's great. Well, look, um, Michael, I think our time probably is almost up. Um, it's been fantastic talking to you. I know you haven't seen my production yet. Um, I've actually seen your little snippet that's on the Massey University website, and I actually think we're on the same page, which is just amazing. Um, certainly it's taken me a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I have to say, and we did speak about this the uh, magic of using iPad and iMovie and, and the things that, that you can achieve on those. So look, um, any final words before we go, Michael? Oh, thanks very much for interviewing me, Dee. It's been a real pleasure. Um, and thanks for all your energy that you've put into the clip that everyone's just seen. It's, uh, it's awesome. It's too Mickey. Yeah, it's hashtag massively too Mickey. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Ka kite. Ka kite anō.